That leak in the roof has gotten worse. Your house is falling apart almost as fast as your body is. Boom. Got me. Sporadic drops of water managed to weave through the endless labyrinth of old wood and insulation and down onto my face. One of the drops even landed on a tear once. What are the chances of that happening, I wonder? I mean, I guess it happens a lot when you cry near a leak. Hmm. You could write a Shel Silverstein poem about that. I've been in this closet for three hours. I should get out of here. I don't want to get out of here. It's safe in here. Michael, it's time to get off the floor. Mmm, no sale. Hey, am I doing credits on this episode? Let's talk about this guy. This young, energetic, intensely creative, insensitive jerk. Oh, to be young. I wanted to be famous so bad, (laughs) I craved it. I wanted to be seen as this famous game developer, and I was, for, for a time, a dream I'm sure is still alive in the hearts of many. I didn't listen, I gossiped, I was really hard to work with sometimes, I mean, I doled out a lot of apologies being that guy, and I probably owe a lot of people a lot more, so one, I'm sorry, and I think that's the type of retrospection you do when you suffer that big of a trauma as you just kind of replay your entire life and you're like, I wasn't as good as I could be. The shit you realize when you can't move for four months. We'll get to that in a second. I mean, I did good work. My problem was that I I knew it. I saw everything as a binary and I don't regret any of this time. Don't get me wrong. I loved every second of it. And I'm not trying to be too hard on myself, But ask anyone I've worked with, I was difficult, to say the least. Be worth more than you cost. A phrase that used to get tossed around a lot. I got your back. Yeah, really? No, no, I will run. Oh, well, (laughs) perfect. And I miss it. Creating the Borderlands world and characters along with that incredible team is the towering highlight of my professional game career. But also, I was kind of a dick a lot of... Well, it, it, it's, bo- it's both things. It's, it's both of the things. It was fun. It was amazing. I wouldn't trade that 16 years for the world. I experienced something more traumatic than... A stroke, which I'd already experienced in 2011, so I'm speaking from my own experiences here. The 2017 event itself manifested originally as a flu, possibly triggered by a flu. No one is sure, and we'd never find out. Some people's bodies just aren't built right. Over the course of a single day, when I was already in the hospital, my body stopped being at all functional, and then my brain went. And I have a memory of, but not with any specifics from, that time. It was the single strangest thing I've ever experienced in my entire life. After a bit more than a day, they had me on steroids, which brought me about 20% of the way back physically, but it brought me back pretty close mentally, really just enough to have a, a bad memory of the trauma. It started in the hospital. I could feel my mental faculties starting to slip. But before we get too deep into the aftermath of that... Here's a funny story. So I had an MRI scheduled for one of the days. There were a lot of MRIs. I didn't end up making it to that specific test until later that night, even though it was scheduled in the morning. That's normal. You get bumped around all the time. My dad had asked me earlier in the day if he could watch a college basketball game in the room. My family didn't really leave once I was in there, and I made them watch I can't even tell you how many episodes of Diners, Drive-Ins, and Dives. So it was really only fair. Somehow in my head, I got in there the idea that this was the most important basketball game my father would ever watch in his life, which was check my notes here not even remotely true to be fair i i could not really tell you who was playing the game for the life of me 
and I was totally out of it before the MRI, which is important to where this story is going. For reference, I am not good with enclosed spaces, which is a real drag with MRIs, a thing I've had more than 30 of in my lifetime. You're essentially in this really tight cave with a cage clasped around your face, and the whole thing makes the noise of a narwhal getting cozy with a very plugged in belt sander. <laughs> I literally cannot get through one of these as I am too claustrophobic. They have to put me on this drug called Ativan to go in there, which, well, it's an anti-anxiety drug that is very powerful and gets you very <laughs> One time after an MRI, I looked at a painting of a tree in the lobby and an angel walked out from behind the tree and, and uh, he's, he started talking to me. I remember vividly my mother did not handle that exchange well. That is Ativan. So we are about 45 minutes into the narwhal sanding and I suddenly remember, you need to help your dad win this basketball game. So logically, I'm like, hey Michael, you need to use this machine to develop telekinetic powers while you're in the radiation duct that can work over a television signal. I mean, it, when you say it back out loud, it doesn't make any sense, but I assure you this made perfect sense in the claustrophobia tube. And as this session was ending, I had somehow convinced myself I had magical powers that I had somehow given to myself. And as they're wheeling me back to the room and I see a bowl on a table, I ever so stealthily, under the blanket, I do this little whoop, and the bowl falls off the table. I can't really explain why that happened, but it's 100 million percent possible that I hallucinated that entire exchange. Or a bull just fell off a table while I was high on MRI drugs. <laughs> they wheel me into the room, and I just decided which of the two teams was the one that my dad was cheering for, because I, I, didn't, I didn't know. In those precious and consequential opening moments, I ever so cleverly moved the ball where I wanted it to go using my amazing newfound MRI-based hospital cable telekinesis powers. I do recall that I lost consciousness before the game was over. You're on a lot of stuff when you go through something like this and your body gets really used to just passing out at the drop of a hat. As far as I knew, this is where the story ended. <laughs> okay, so about... Three months later, uh, I was hanging out with my sister, Stephanie, and I walked the conversation ever so cleverly uh, toward this moment I remembered where, where I, I thought I had psychic powers. But I thought I was doing it, like if this is the blanket, I thought I was kind of, you know. I was bending and juning it. So I, I kind of point blank asked her, hey, did you notice me being a little weird? And she, <laughs> this is so bad. She, this, this might be my favorite thing ever. So she just looks at me and just busts out laughing. So she starts mimicking me. Like, here's where I thought I was. And she's like, you just had your arms in the air screaming about Professor Xavier. <laughs> they wheeled me into the room and I was like, Dad, I got this. I got telekinetics. <laughs> it's almost worth it for that story. I never got better. Physically, I stayed between 40 and 50% of where I was, and that's where I stayed. Yes, that includes moving a mouse. I believe Freud called it repetition compulsion, the mind's tendency to repeat traumatic events in order to deal with them, or in my case, not deal with them. The repetition can take the form of dreams, storytelling, hallucinations, or even internet movie shows. Immobilized, you can trigger yourself with anything. 
I knew I was going to die someday and it was probably going to be painful and without a body left that can move, which has not changed. It just doesn't trigger me anymore because I've accepted it. This loop, this constant loop of anxiety about real dangers that were presently affecting me, that would never stop affecting me and diminishing my quality of life. You can break your brain doing that. Trust me, I did. And this also gave rise to my alter ego, Doug, the fruitless wino hippie. Say hello, Doug. PTSD never goes away. This was traumatic enough that it took me 15 months to even talk about it more than one video about me pooping in a trash can, which addressed exactly 0% of this. I hid it from everyone. It made everyone I care about think I was okay when I, when I really, really wasn't. I wanted everyone to believe Mikey's fine, he's strong, and I am, but I don't know if anybody's that strong. It's like fighting a waterfall with a toy umbrella. It doesn't work. And my momentum was great coming into 2017. Outlets wanted me to write for them. I was getting offers to send in submissions for real big deal stuff, and I tried to do about a million percent too much at a time I was sobbing in a leaky closet for up to five hours a day, depending on what my business schedule looked like. And in person, I was pretty much an off-putting garbage volcano for the mass of 2017. Ask literally anyone who interacted with me that year. Need I draw our attention once again to Doug the Fruitless Wino Hippie? I couldn't deal with any of it. I just made art on this show to cope my way through it to talk about the things that still somehow made some sense to me, which was film. It was movie therapy for me in conjunction with a lot of physical and mental therapy as well. You ain't lived until someone is super pumped you kicked a plastic cup about four inches with your big toe. I had to relearn how to walk with any confidence at home and at PT and it took like a month. I made moon and arrival that month while literally teaching myself to walk. That's why Sam is a great hero in the story. He is created to have an end date, much like all of us, but he is not ready to die even if his body clearly is. You can hear my voice change over the 2017 episodes. It's a trip when you really go back and listen to it. I mean, I think my voice is still all messed up. I have to concentrate on pronunciation literally all of the time now. I didn't take inventory of any of this. I just figured I was better because I was alive, but broken. The moon episode is about a man whose body is dying and he will not quit no matter what you throw at him. An episode I edited 15 minutes at a time with the back of my hand while holding up my entirely atrophied neck in my other hand. Emperor's New Groove episode made a distinct point that there are some things in the past you cannot go back to as I started coming to terms with that very thing. The Stranger Things episode built up to Will going through a traumatic experience and then waking up in the hospital. The John Wick 2 essay is about how much self-inflicted damage one man can do to himself and his relationships when he is psychologically compromised. I did this to me. I literally said it in the episode. And Creed, in one sentence, get off the damn floor. I gave myself 10 Rudy speeches in a row because I'd suffered a pretty horrific thing. And I became a full-time YouTuber in the exact instant I went through something experts say, whoa, you should take a minute with that friend. But I wanted to already be better before I got better. I had to start trying to get better, Wonder Woman. An episode I specifically called out that PTSD side plot in because it helped me get off the floor. I would edit the show and then I'd slowly start chipping away at this massive anxiety cloud in this tiny closet. I'd alternate those two things with eating and sleeping and that was pretty much it. I did that through December when I actually started making an effort to get back out onto the world, ruined body and all, because that was the last hurdle. 
you have no choice but to surrender to the lingering truth of your current situation and say, this happened. And you will carry that grief like a boulder up a hill until you just accept it. This happened. The world will not weep for you. Get off the floor. If Wonder Woman at the end of the year was when I finally got off the floor, Amelie is when I was grasping in the dark for the bottom of the well. What's wing with me? Last spring, I had a dented gutter in the front of my house. Texas hail damage, uh, to wit, basically a baseball hit it. It didn't look great and I was a little slow to fix it or check the mail or generally be aware that this was a problem. Turns out the city that I live in had noticed and politely sent me many notes that I was presently unaware of for previously mentioned reasons. The notes, uh, well, I stopped being kind and suddenly I had a court date because failure to fix this was a crime. I had crimed. It gets worse from here, but you gotta laugh with me through this part because it's objectively hilarious and I totally give you permission to laugh. Okay, I live in a house from the 1970s. Texas Earth is, let's just say, super generous and lowered my house a good eight inches over its lifetime. What happened was that the matter I was flushing down the toilet was getting stuck in that fresh incline. So I left to be in a hospital for 10 days and that whole situation uh, solidified. So the next time I flushed something significant down a toilet, it caused, well, it caused a backup in the sewer line that started bringing literally everything back up through the drain, through every single drain in my house. Bathtubs, showers, sinks, all of it, all at the same time, just, oh, oh, the horror. Oh, it was such a horror. Oh, God. I want to remind you that this was when I rediscovered the fine art of walking like an overconfident toddler. I could basically get from my bed to any bathroom for up to five minutes. It took a lot. It took a long time to clean up. It was... Oh. And to make matters worse, it... Well, it cost about $12,000 to uh, earn the luxury of flushing my toilets again, as they had... Well, they, they dug up my entire front yard and then replaced all of the plumbing leading out of the house. I cleaned up every drain in the house. It was not great, and I, in fact, fell a bunch. And there are scars from that. Cool scars. The people are like, damn, bro. It's a cool scar. It took a couple of weeks or so, but I got the pipe and subsequently my yard fixed. Thanks, Mom. Installed new gutters, got a fresh paint job in the exterior of the house, and pled. No contest to, uh, a crime. I paid the fine and I was at least on some upward slope after months of dealing with the anxiety of, I mean, this entire situation and subsequently also eating ramen for the rest of my natural life. For a second, I saw a way off the floor, but the next couple of months were very rough horrible, in fact, for a litany of reasons, and I was back hiding in that closet every single day. Over the next couple months, I was powerless to get myself off the ground. In the middle of making a series of bad business decisions, my friend died, and I was at the bottom of the well. That was the bottom. That was the bottom. I started making lists, scheduling every single day, and during that day, I was, I was writing things down like, eat food just to find a rhythm and a sense of normalcy again. I wanted to feel like a human being that did more than give himself pep talks on his YouTube show and cry in a closet. Though both of those things are also fine. And by the end of the year, I kind of had a handle on being a person. 2018 so far has been very good. Sorry, I mean for me, not like for the world. A crucible can change a person for the better. Gets rid of a lot of the bullshit. You literally no longer have time or patience for the person you used to be. Here's the truth. Being sick made me a better person. And that's how I accepted it. Hello. 
you're probably not used to seeing me during the credits, I thought I'd check in on everyone. I've been working on this piece for three weeks, um, because I think that's what art is, and I think that YouTube is an art form that lends beautifully into that, and I wanted to, I wanted to, to speak to, to why it felt I was a little bit off for a while. Um, I made a really, really strong effort to make 2018 like, oh, that's what we thought 2017 was going to be. And uh, obviously, I got to thank all these wonderful patrons like Existential Carrot. <laughs> Beautiful. Chef's kiss. Sorry. That's a chef's kiss. I did it wrong. Um, but yeah, I put up the Patreon. Patreon when I was about to quit my job and it became my job in all of an hour and that was overwhelming when it happened and I never got to thank you all for for making that happen one really cool thing that just happened uh, so we finally we were made we got a hundred thousand subs and they sent us a plaque and that that was I don't know it sort of it sort of made it all feel real like this whole this whole youtube experiment of like hey make art on a platform that values disposability uh so why not make films out of that and and try to not be disposable um i was gonna i was gonna throw to the names and i was like there's no good jokes to to be like what about disposable people Hello. Uh, no, that's these people are indispensable. Um, so really, I just like thank you guys for sticking with me through all this just madness. And uh, hopefully, as you can tell, I'm I'm mostly I don't want to say okay. I'm I'm here. I'm present. I'm working to make every day good. Uh, my house is clean. That's a thing. I mean, right, right here's probably not, but it's also the the set, I guess. Where, where are we going? We're going over to Patrick Mahoney's house with Brad Hunziger and Walrus. That's a party, man. Mahoney, Hunziger, and Walrus. Two things: my favorite party and my favorite law firm. And walrus. Uh, thank you. I love you all. Thank you.